a very good evening aspirants welcome to hindu news analysis brought to you by shankar ias academy today is 25th of march 2022 the list of articles we are going to discuss today is displayed on the screen look at the first topic it is taken from the text and context page in this article discussion we will learn about the reasons behind the price hike in petrol and regarding the second and third topic we will discuss about the penguin and the tb in prelims perspective and regarding the fourth topic we will learn about ladakh's eastern boundary and some of the agreements signed between india and china we will discuss about the significance of the agreement in terms of india china relationship and then we will discuss about the chauri chaura massacre which is very important in modern india syllabus and then we will see the appointment of high court judges and we will conclude our discussion by solving some of the preliminary practice questions so without wasting much time let's get into the discussion now look at this news article this news article is taken from the text and context page see this is going to be a really interesting topic because this question has popped up now and then for everyone who uses a bike or a scooter or a car i hope you would have guessed our topic of discussion yes it is going to be regarding the petrol price So today in our discussion let's cover about what is happening between the crude oil price and the petrol price then we will move on to the mysterious area that is the reasons behind this rise in petrol price okay before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it first let's start with the answer to the question that is what is happening between the crude oil price and the petrol price see just have a look at these graphs you can clearly see that the retail prices of petrol and diesel seems to be increasing even when the crude oil price is decreasing am i right see today let's just focus on the petrol price you can see that there is a wide gap existing between the retail prices of petrol and crude oil price now the next question arises that is what is the reason behind this rise see first you have to understand the method by which the retail prices of petrol is calculated Let me just make it simple for you. Just have a look at this table. See, I have taken the break up of retail price of petrol in Delhi, and this is on October 16, 2021. Okay, and if you look at the table, you can understand that around 54 percentage of retail price of petrol comprise of central and state taxes. See, the central government taxes the production of petroleum products, while the state government taxes their sale. Okay. Here from the table itself you can see that the central government levies an excise duty of rupees 33 per liter on petrol which makes up 31 percentage of current retail price of petrol and in addition to this the excise duty which is uniform across the country state also levy sales tax or value added tax that is the vat which varies across states for instance odisha levies 32 percentage vat on petrol while uttar pradesh levies 26.8 percentage vat or rupees 18.74 per liter whichever is higher when we take our example that is delhi it levies 30 percentage vat on petrol see in addition to the tax rates shown in the graph many state governments such as tamil nadu also levy certain additional levies such as cess it is around 11.5 rupees per liter Now from knowing about this calculation of retail price of petrol we can understand one important reason for this petrol price rise what is it it is the central excise duty and the state vat imposed on petrol now just look at this graph from this news article see here you can see that the center's excise duty on petrol kept on increasing even when the crude oil price was decreasing at the same time period i am repeating it again that is the center's excise duty on petrol kept on increasing when the crude oil price was decreasing okay and here you have to understand one more point though the central excise duty and the state vat both contribute much of the retail price of petrol the central excise duty dominated even when the crude oil price decreased but at the same time you can see that the state's vat has tried to remain constant and then it has started to decline So now according to this data who is the ultimate contributor to the rise in retail price of petrol and yes it is the central government who impose large amount of excise duty 
So, relief to consumers from higher fuel prices could only be expected when central government decides to cut tax rates. And that's all regarding this news article. So, in this news article discussion, we discussed what is the relation between crude oil price and the retail petrol price. Then, we discussed the mysterious area that is the reasons behind the rise in petrol price. That is the main reasons are the central excise duty and the state VAT. We know that the crude oil price is increasing as an impact of Russia-Ukraine war. So, we can expect a rise in the retail price of petrol. Okay. See, the relief to the consumers can be provided by reducing the central excise duty on petrol or by reducing or bringing the state's VAT on petrol to zero. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this article here. It is about the research by a German scientist in the South Antarctica. He spent 5 months in South Antarctica trying to discover why penguins are rapidly dying. And according to him, penguins are being decimated by the deadly typhus producing human virus Salmonella. And his theory is that the virus is being spread by seagulls who acts as carriers. So, this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, we are going to learn about penguins, its habitat and the threats faced by them, etc. See, penguins are torpedo-shaped flightless birds that live in the southern regions of the earth. The smallest penguin species is the little or little blue penguin. These birds grow to 10 to 12 inches. The largest penguin is the emperor penguin. It grows to 36 to 44 inches and all penguins live in the southern hemisphere though it is a common myth that they all live in Antarctica. That is they can live in Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, South Africa and several islands located between latitudes 45 degree and 58 degree south. And in fact penguins can be found on every continent in the southern hemisphere. See, it is also a myth that penguins can only live in cold climates. The Galapagos penguin, for example, lives on tropical islands at the equator. So, some penguins can live in tropical climates too. Now, let's see some more details about their habitat. See, penguins require habitats where nature provides them with shelter, enough food and space where they can interact and reproduce. A habitat is an area where a species lives because it allows its survival, development and reproduction, increasing its chances of survival. And these highly specialized marine birds are adapted to living at sea. Some species spend up to 80% of their life in the water or several months during the year in the ocean and only use icebergs as places to rest. Penguins are usually found near nutrient-rich cold water currents that provides an abundant supply of food. And if it is the time to settle, then they generally live on the islands and remote continental regions which are free from land predators, where their inability to fly is not detrimental to their survival. See, different species thrive in varying climates ranging from Galapagos penguins on tropical islands at the equator to emperor penguins restricted to the pack ice and waters of Antarctica. The seasons of the southern hemisphere are opposite to those of the northern hemisphere. When continents above the equator experience spring and summer, the areas below the equator experience fall and winter. The most southerly penguin colony in the world are a group of adelies that regularly nest near Camp Royds in Antarctica. And with this basic information, let's see the threats faced by them. One of the threats is overfishing. See, penguins feed on fish and krills. So, overfishing leads to food depletion for penguins and they don't get adequate nutrition. Now, the second threat is oil spills. Because penguins spend the majority of their lives at sea. So, oil spills and other oceanic pollution can be devastating. Thirdly, poaching. While penguin hunting or egg harvesting is illegal, it still occurs in the areas where penguins live close to human settlements. Now, the fourth threat is the introduction of invasive species. The predators can devastate even the largest nesting colony in just a few years. And finally comes the climate change. 
the changing temperatures and the current patterns of the world's ocean are dangerous for penguins these birds depend on current for hunting and the warmer temperatures not only alter the currents where fish and krills can be found but also melt antarctic ice reducing the breeding space for several penguin species and penguins are sadly one of the most threatened groups of seabirds with half of the 18 species listed by the bird life international as either vulnerable or endangered and in the iucn red list some species are listed as least concerned and some species are listed as near threatened and some are listed as vulnerable this is because of the decrease in the population of the species see penguin is threatened by these many factors and necessary action should be taken to conserve the species now we will do a quick recap we have seen that penguins are torpedo shaped flightless birds that live in the southern regions of the earth and it is a common myth that they only live in antarctica because they can live in antarctica australia new zealand chile argentina south africa and several islands located between the latitudes 45 degree and 58 degree south and it is also a myth that penguins can live only in cold climates for example galapagos penguin lives on tropical islands at the equator and we have seen that penguins are usually found near nutrient rich cold water currents that provides an abundant supply of food and then we saw the threats faced by the species they are overfishing oil spills poaching introduction of invasive species and the climate change that's all regarding this news article let us move on to the next one now take a look at this news article see yesterday was world tuberculosis day and according to this news article india tb report 2022 was also released yesterday the report noted that the number of incident tb patients had been increased during 2021 from 2020 despite this fact the health minister reaffirmed the government's commitment to make india tuberculosis free by 2025 and he also said that This will be achieved by ensuring access to quality healthcare and advanced treatment. So taking this as an opportunity, let us quickly go through tuberculosis. See, tuberculosis is a communicable disease caused by a bacteria. It most often affects the lungs and sometimes it also affects other organs. See, each and every word I just said is important. Tuberculosis is a communicable disease because it is capable of being transmitted from person to person or from the environment to the person. They are caused by bacteria and to be specific they are caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. They most often affect the lungs and sometimes also affects other organs. When the bacteria affect the lungs we call it as pulmonary TB and when the bacteria affects outside the lungs we call it as extra pulmonary tb note that there are two types of tb infections they are active tb and latent tb see people with latent tb do not have any symptoms and cannot spread tb and if they do not get treatment they may develop active tb disease in the future and they will spread the disease to others and feel quite ill the tb bacteria becomes active if the immune system cannot stop them from growing and this is the reason why active tb disease is contagious that means it can be spread from one person to another having a brief idea about tb now we will see some of the common symptoms of tb they are prolonged cough chest pain weakness or fatigue weight loss fever and night sweats now how do they spread See as i already said it is a communicable disease and the medium through which the bacteria spread is air tb spread through the air when the people with tb cough sneeze or spit according to world health organization a person need to inhale only a few germs to become infected every year 10 million people fall ill with tuberculosis despite being a preventable and curable disease 1.5 million people die from tb each year making it the world's top infectious killer not only this tb is the leading cause of death of people with hiv and also a major contributor to antimicrobial resistance 
Note that about one quarter of the world's population is estimated to be infected by TB bacteria, and only five to fifteen percent of these people will fall ill with acute TB disease. The rest have TB infection but are not ill and cannot transmit the disease. Remember, both TB infection and disease are curable using antibiotics. The common drugs include rifampicin and isoniazid. C. TB is among India's most deadly infectious disease with an estimated 2.8 million confirmed cases in 2015 and this data is according to a World Health Organization report. India's TB burden is the highest in the world. It is followed by Indonesia and China. Note that about one third of the world's population is diagnosed with latent TB, which means they have been infected by the TB bacteria from an actively sick person without their knowledge. Now let's have a quick recap. We have seen that tuberculosis is a communicable disease caused by a bacteria that most often affects the lungs. There are two types of TB infection. They are acute TB and latent TB. And we have seen some of the common symptoms of TB disease. It includes prolonged cough, chest pain, weakness, weight loss, fever, and night sweats. Then we have discussed that TB is both preventable and curable. And we have seen some of the common drugs. It includes rifampicin and isoniazid. So that's all regarding this news article. Now we will move on to the next one. Now take a look at this editorial article. As the title itself hints, this news article talks about the eastern boundary of Ladakh. As per the article, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi is in India, and he is expected to meet External Affairs Minister Mr. S. Jay Shankar and the National Security Advisor Mr. Ajit Doval. And according to the author, it is a good time to talk about the peculiar case of Ladakh's eastern boundary and the unnecessary ongoing conflicts. We hope the ministers of both the countries talks about it when they meet. So this is the crux of this news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through some of the important points mentioned in the article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. Firstly, you have to understand why do they call eastern boundary of Ladakh a peculiar case. See, in these maps, you can see the location of Ladakh. You can clearly see that Ladakh is bordered by the Tibet Autonomous Region to the east, the Indian state of Himachal Pradesh to the south, both the Indian administered Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir and the Pakistan administered Gilgit Baltistan to the west and the southwest corner of Xinjiang. across the karakoram pass in the north as you know india attained independence on 15th of august 1947 and the people's republic of china was proclaimed on 1st of october 1949 see both india and china were under different administrations before these dates but no serious border problems had faced these administrations it all started after the independence And today the China India border dispute is nothing but an ongoing territorial dispute over the sovereignty of two relatively large and several smaller separated piece of territory between India and China. So let me explain this. See, India following the independence believed it has inherited firm boundaries from the British. But this was contrary to China's view. China felt that the British had left behind a disputed legacy on the boundary dispute between the two newly formed republics. As a result, the border between India and China is not clearly demarcated throughout. See, along certain stretches of its 3500 km length, there is no mutually agreed line of actual control which is LAC. Now what is this LAC? See, line of actual control is nothing but a notional demarcation line that separates India controlled territory from the Chinese controlled territory in the Sino-Indian border dispute. Here in this image you can see how the line of actual control is demarcated. As you can see, the India-China border is divided into 3 sectors, namely the western, middle and the eastern sector. See the boundary dispute in the western sector pertains to the Johnson line proposed by the British in the 1860s. It extended up to the Kunlun mountains and put Akshay Chin in the then princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. 
and the independent india used the johnson line and claimed akshay chin as its own china initially did not show any reluctance when india said so in the early 1950s but later in the years that followed china reversed its position claiming that it has never agreed to the johnson line and hence china saw no reason to give akshay chin to india and in the middle sector the dispute is a minor one it is the only one on which india and china have exchanged maps that they both agree on now the disputed boundary in the eastern sector of the india china border is over the mikman line see the representatives of china india and tibet in 1913 to 14 met in shimla where an agreement was proposed to settle the boundary between tibet and india and tibet and china though the chinese representatives at the meeting initial the agreement they subsequently refused to accept it the tawang tract claimed by china was taken over by india in 1951 till the 1960s china controlled akshay chin in the west while india controlled the boundary up to the mikman line in the east nearly 6 decades have passed since then but the boundary issue remains unsolved and now it has turned into one of the most protracted border disputes in the world since 1981 when the first round of border talks was held officials from india and china have met a number of times to find a solution to this issue having seen about the ongoing china india border dispute now let's specifically see about the eastern border of ladakh the story actually started before the independence itself see ladakh emerged as a distinct entity with the treaty of timoskhang in 1684 This treaty established relations between Leh and Lhasa through trade exchanges. We know that Lhasa is the capital of the Tibet Autonomous Region. And with the Treaty of Chushul in 1842, Ladakh and Tibet agreed to maintain the status quo. Later, the Treaty of Amritsar in 1846 between the East India Company and the state of Kashmir included Ladakh with its eastern boundary undefined. and the focus remained on pashmina trade for making shawls and after british took over governance of india attention shifted to the northern boundary of ladakh because of the russian advance into central asia in 1870 a british joint commissioner was posted at leh which continued good relations and correspondence with the dalai lama and the chinese amban at lhasa and with the kashmir state all these factors hit the reality that The customary boundary was defined only for the limited area under human occupation. The remaining region except under the human occupation was left undefined. Later, the authoritative gazetteer of Kashmir and Ladakh which was published in 1890 stated that the boundary with the Chinese Tibet from the Karakoram to the head of the Changchenmo Valley is quite doubtful. Here in this map you can see the location of Changchenmo Valley. It also stated that the boundary is clear only for the area to the south and the west which represents actual human occupations. The gazetteer described unoccupied Aksai Chin as neutral territory. That is it is suitable for wheeled transport. And this is the place where the Chinese built their road. Later the development of a common understanding has progressed. going from establishing respective claims to acknowledging the ground reality an example for this is the signing of the agreement on the maintenance of peace and tranquility along the line of actual control in 1993 this agreement brought in diplomats and the dialogue moved from history to principles after 15 rounds of talks the focus shifted to the ground situation in 2020 and the recent joint statement which was held on 13th of january 2022 emphasized the importance of continuing the military and diplomatic dialogue and it emphasized reaching a mutually acceptable resolution of the remaining issues as soon as possible in order to advance bilateral relations see to conclude despite each side labeling the other side as aggressor and having periodic military occurrences the solution lies in the equally unique 70 year old continuing dialogue in a bold political move an agreement on the watershed boundary based on a well established principle is required 
this would help in addressing not only india and china's national security concerns but also avoid intractable sovereignty disputes i know this discussion has many historical facts and agreements but it is quite important in terms of india and china's relationship and this editorial concludes that the dialogue is the best way forward i know we can't remember every facts given here but some agreements and the terms like line of control can be used in your answer writing so that's all regarding this editorial now we will move on to next news article discussion look at this article here this is about the album that is issued by the publicity department of the united provinces and it contains photographs that depicts the chauri chaura incident the pictures reproduce the burnt police station and the bodies of the victims this is the crux of the article now we are going to discuss about the incident in detail from prelims point of view see if you want to know about the chauri chaura incident then first you should know about non cooperation movement See, non-cooperation movement was started in the year 1921 under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. It was a mass movement. It was a non-violent khilafat non-cooperation movement. It had two main aim. The first aim is to redress the wrong things done to the people of Punjab and Turkey. And the second aim was the attainment of Swaraj. See, there are many reasons for the launch of the non-cooperation movement. To begin with the first world war added to the misery of the indian people heavy taxes high prices famines and epidemics made the people's life miserable secondly rowlett act invited large scale protests throughout the country and thirdly jallian wala bag massacre and the injustice done to punjab made indians angry and uh, the muslims became unhappy due to the ill treatment of turkey So they started Khilafat movement. Finally, many sections of the Indian society suffered considerable economic distress. In the towns, workers and artisans, the middle class had been hit by high prices and shortage of food and essential commodities. And the rural poor and the peasants were victims of widespread drought and epidemics. So the Congress session at Nagpur in 1920 adopted Gandhi ji's idea of non-cooperation. See, the non-cooperation movement progressed in several stages. The first one is the renunciation of titles. See, Subramanya Iyer and Rabindranath Tagore renounced their honorary titles sir that they received from the British. Gandhi ji also returned his Kaiser hi Hind medal. Now the second one is resigning of important jobs. We know that many officers resigned their jobs. Now the third stage is the boycott of legislatures. Many people refused to cast vote when the elections to the legislatures were held. It was followed by the boycott of schools and colleges, law courts, etc. And the final stage is the non-payment of taxes. This was a powerful method of fighting an oppressive government. The people were not ready to recognize the government as legitimate. Then the movement was progressing into a mass movement. See, educated middle class led the movement in towns and cities. Educational institutions, law courts and foreign goods were boycotted. The peasants organized the movements against talukdars and landlords in villages under the leadership of Baba Ramchandra. Tribal people started an armed struggle in the hills of Andhra Pradesh under the leadership of Alluri Sitaram Raju. Workers in the plantations of Assam started a struggle to get their right to free movement but unfortunately Gandhi ji called up the movement and this is because of the Chauri Chaura incident and yes it was true that the non cooperation movement was gaining momentum and it started becoming a mass movement but in some places it became violent also one such incident is the Chauri Chaura incident In February 2022 in Chauri Chaura people who are protesting as a part of non cooperation movement were arrested in response to this again a protest was conducted the armed police who were dispatched to control the situation opened fire upon the crowd the agitated crowd attacked and set fire to the police station killing all of its occupants the incident led to the deaths of 3 civilians and 23 policemen and uh, Mahatma Gandhi 
who was strictly against the violence halted the non cooperation movement on the national level on 12th of february 1922 as a direct result of this incident he thought that it was necessary to train the people in non violence satyagraha now we will have a quick recap what all we saw today in this discussion we saw about non cooperation movement it was started for two aims the first aim is to redress the wrong things done to the people of punjab and turkey and the second aim was to attain swaraj and we have seen many reasons for the launch of non cooperation movement and some of the reasons were the first world war added to the misery of indian people and second the rowlatt act invited large scale protest throughout the country and thirdly the jallian wala bag massacre so the congress session at nagpur in 1920 adopted the idea of non cooperation and we have seen several stages of non cooperation movement the first one is a renunciation of titles and the second one is resigning of important jobs and the third stage is the boycott of legislatures and the final stage is the non payment of tax and uh, we have also seen that when the movement was gaining the momentum gandhi ji called off the movement and this is because of the chauri chaura incident which led to deaths of 23 policemen that's all about this article discussion with these points let us move on to the next one see this article here it says that nine judges are appointed to five high courts the department of justice and the law ministry said that six of the new judges were advocates while the remaining three were judicial officers and according to the government there are 405 vacancies against the sanctioned strength of 1104 judges in the 25 high courts this is the crux of the article given here in this context we are going to see the procedure for the appointment of judges to high court see in the constitution of india article 217 is concerned with the appointment of judges to the high court first of all let us see about the qualification and for this clause 2 of article 217 says that a person shall not be qualified for appointment as a judge of a high court unless he is a citizen of india that is the first qualification is the judge of the high court should be a citizen of india and secondly he or she should have held a judicial office in the territory of india for at least 10 years and thirdly he or she should have been an advocate of a high court or of two or more such courts in succession for at least 10 years see here you have to be careful many aspirants fall prey to the provisions here because unlike in the case of the supreme court the constitution makes no provision for appointment of a distinguished jurist as a judge of a high court that is in the supreme court a distinguished jurist can be appointed as a judge but it is not in the case of high court now having this understanding of qualification for the judges now let us see the appointment procedure see according to the constitution of india every judge of high court shall be appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal and it is done after the consultation with the chief justice of india and the governor of the state and if the appointment is for the permanent judge that is the judge other than the chief justice of high court then the chief justice of high court is also consulted see in the appointment process you should know an important point that is in the second judge's case the supreme court ruled that no appointment of judge of the supreme court can be made unless it is confirmed with the opinion of chief justice of india and again in the third judge's case the supreme court opined that in case of the appointment of high court judges the chief justice of india should consult a collegium of two senior most judges of the supreme court so the sole opinion of the chief justice of india alone does not constitute the consultation process so overall for the appointment of the chief justice of high court the chief justice of india and the governor of the concerned state is consulted here the chief justice of india should consult two senior most judges of the supreme court and for the permanent judge the chief justice of india governor of the state and also the chief justice of high court is consulted and here also the chief justice of india should consult at least two senior most judges and according to article 217 the appointed person shall hold the office until he or she attains the age of 62 years now to recap class 2 of the article 207 talks about the qualification of high court judges 
we have seen three qualification that is a person should be a citizen of india and he or she should have held a judicial office in the territory of india for at least 10 years and regarding the third qualification he or she should have been an advocate of a high court or of two or more such courts in succession for at least 10 years and we have also seen an important provision that is unlike in the case of the supreme court the constitution makes no provision for appointment of distinguished jurist as a judge of a high court and finally for the appointment of chief justice of high court the cji and the governor of the concerned state is consulted the cji here in turn should consult two senior more judges of supreme court and for the permanent judge along with chief justice of india and the governor of the state the chief justice of high court is also consulted and here also the chief justice of india in turn should consult two senior most judges of supreme court and then we have seen that the judges that is the high court judges hold the office until he or she attains the age of 62 years and that's all regarding this news article with these key learned points let's move on to the next part of our news article discussion which is nothing but preliminary practice questions Look at the first question. Consider the following statement about tuberculosis. Statement 1. Both TB infection and the disease are curable using antibiotics. And statement 2. Even person with latent TB may develop active TB disease in the future and spread the disease to others if they do not get treatment. You have to find the incorrect statement. See here, we saw in our discussion that both the TB infection and the disease are curable using antibiotics. We have also seen some of the drugs which includes rifampicin and isoniazid. So statement 1 is correct. Moving on, statement 2 is also correct because person with latent TB do not have any symptoms and cannot spread TB. But if they do not get treatment, they may develop acute TB disease in the future. Then they will spread the disease to others and feel quite ill. So here statement 2 is also correct. Now look carefully, the question asks for incorrect statement. So, neither one of the statements are wrong. So, the correct option is option D, neither one not two. Now, look at the second question. It is regarding penguins. Consider the following statements with reference to penguins. Statement 1, penguins are only found in the continent of Antarctica. And statement 2, the IUCN status of emperor penguin is least concerned. You have to find the correct statement. See, in this question, both the statements are incorrect. We have discussed that all penguin species live in the southern hemisphere. And we also saw that it is a myth that they only live in Antarctica because they can live in Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, South Africa and several islands. The islands are located between the latitudes 45 degree and 58 degree south. And regarding the second statement, the IUCN status of emperor penguin is near threatened. So here our correct answer is option D, neither one not two. Now look at the third question. It is regarding the High Court Judges. Consider the following statements with reference to appointment of High Court Judges. Statement 1. Chief Justice of India should consult a collegium of four senior most judges of the Supreme Court. And statement 2. President appoints a judges of the High Court. Which of the above statements are correct? See here, statement 1 is wrong. Because the Chief Justice of India should consult a collegium of two senior most judges of Supreme Court. In the case of appointment of judges of Supreme Court only, that CJA consults a collegium of four senior most judges. Here the question is about the High Court judge. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming back to statement 2. We saw in our discussion that as per article 217, every judge of the High Court shall be appointed by the President by warrant under his hand and seal. So statement 2 is absolutely correct. So our correct answer here is option B, 2 only. Now look at the last question. Consider the following statements with reference to non-cooperation movement. Statement 1. Non-cooperation movement remained a non-violent movement till the end. And statement 2. Chauri Chora incident led to the halt of the non-cooperation movement. And statement 3. Chauri Chora is the killing of innocent people gathered in a bag in Amrister. Which of the above statements is or are incorrect? See here, statement 1 is incorrect because non-cooperation movement was gaining momentum but in some places it became violent. One such incident is the Chauri Chora incident. Regarding statement 2, it is correct. This we saw in our discussion. And statement 3 again is incorrect 
because in february 1922 in chaurichora people who are protesting as part of non cooperation movement were arrested in response to this a protest was conducted again the armed police who were dispatched to control the situation opened fire upon the crowd the agitated crowd attacked and set fire to a police station killing all of its occupants this incident led to the death of 3 civilians and 23 policemen but the incident described in the statement 3 is regarding jallianwala bag massacre so it is incorrect since one is incorrect two is correct and three is incorrect our correct answer here is option c one and three only because the question ask for incorrect statements the main questions are displayed here you can write the answer and post it in the comment section if you like the video hit the like button post your comments and share the video with your friends and don't forget to subscribe shankar ias academy youtube channel thanks for watching